Zoom. We will go ahead and move forward now into our theme for the day. So this summer we looked at virtual and hybrid and what the return to in-person dementia friendly programming might look like. And this fall, turns out COVID's still with us. Huh, who knew that would happen? But anyways, this fall we decided to take a little deeper dive into the virtual world and the hybrid world, um, knowing that some we, some of us, including myself, were left with lingering questions about, but how really do you do this thing where some, you know, for hybrid, how some people are in one room and some people are elsewhere, or even for virtual programming, how do you really connect, do it and do it well? So we want to take a deeper dive. And today our focus will be on virtual dementia-friendly programming and specifically ways to build meaningful connection online and inclusive environments online. And we have three people who will share with us today from our members. And that includes Elisa Toronto Strayer, Kaylin Bergstrom, and Lindsay Waldner. And so I'll go ahead and introduce them and, and what they're planning to share on. They each have five to seven minutes, um, and we'll have some discussions at the end. So first up will be Elisa. And Elisa is the Memory Loss Program Coordinator with the Greenwood Senior Center in North Seattle. And um, Elisa and others, uh, if you could just share on a quick snapshot of what dementia-friendly program or programs you offer, and then the two questions, what has most helped you develop rapport and connection among members of an online dementia-friendly program? And what has most helped you create an inclusive environment online, thinking about things like range of familiarity with technology, or people's different comfort levels speaking up, or different ways that dementia may show up from person to person. So, and I have building rapport and also creating an inclusive environment. And Elisa, you're welcome to go ahead. Okay. Um, hello, everybody. Jen, I told my group, I just haven't laughed that hard till I took crying in a while. So thank you for that. Um, so yeah, my name is Elisa Trotto Strayer, she, her pronouns, and I work at the Greenwood Senior Center. And the three programs that I run are um, a out twice a month hour long brain games program uh, that's open just drop in um, and a art appreciation that's two times a month also one hour long also drop in and then a weekly program called the gathering place that I think many of you are familiar with that's a two hour enrichment program and all of these programs are for primarily for folks in early stage memory loss, though for the brain games and art appreciation, um, there's some kind of mid-stage as well. So for what helps build rapport, um, and I should just say, many of you know this, but I'm a little, I'm early in this position, so I'm still discovering and learning, but the things that have worked so far pretty well are having just, like we did today, easy, silly icebreakers. And so it could be deep, like, or slightly deeper to get to know each other around backgrounds and jobs, things like that. Um, but even for our art class, we were talking about portraits that day. So asked if people had had their portraits done and people like brought portraits that they had of themselves from when they were like four years old and somehow still had. It was beautiful it was, and hilarious too. Some of these portraits were real old school. Um, and then also having some kind of shared emotion. So, so far, since a lot of the programs that I run are more activity-based, it's not a support group. It's been looking at art that really surprises them and they start laughing or just like start sharing their shock and having that shared emotion like we had this morning um, has been a really great way for them to build rapport um, or we listened to salsa music that was just like really joyful and everybody started dancing, even though there's like some pretty like laced up participants in our group. And then once we finished listening to it, everybody was kind of like laughing at how like, man, I didn't think I'd be up here like dancing in my chair as we were listening to that music. Um, and then humor, obviously, as I mentioned, I love laughing. And so that's kind of where I gravitate. That's a safer space for me to go but we have looked at photos and then tried to imagine what what people might say in these photos what are they saying to each other 
and just coming up with silly captions or um, stories that might be going on. So for me, like humor, shared emotion uh, has been really powerful. And for me, it's been challenging to have more sharing around the memory loss experience so far as but hasn't worked really, uh, surprisingly, hasn't built as much connection because there's people with really different experiences with that in the group. So there hasn't been as much shared experience in there. For building inclusive environment online, um, I try and minimize how much they have to do once they're in a Zoom room. So, um, yeah, like they don't need to go to breakout rooms. They don't need to read the chat. I try and just keep it in gallery view. I will share my screen. Um, I'd like to bring in volunteers to help people who are struggling with tech, but we haven't gotten there yet. Um, then in terms of for people in their comfort level and speaking up, I just try and keep an eye on everybody's engagement level. And if I either start to see somebody wandering, like um, losing engagement a little bit, try and bring them in. I, I'll call on them, um, but with something really easy, really, really easy, just to get them kind of hooked back in and bring them back into the circle. Mm -hmm. um, but most important is having a variety of activities. So even for brain games or art appreciation, these shorter programs, having a variety of ways that people can tap in because there's been a lot of, um, it can be challenging for folks, especially for brain games. I hear people be like, oh man, I didn't, I, didn't, I really need to practice this, or I really need to work on being able to, um, you know, keep up with this or that activity, which I am not, I, I, that's not the purpose of these games. And so really trying to have a variety. So at some point people with, no matter where they are, with their memory loss or what their education level is or what their familiarity with a given topic is, there's a way for them to feel successful. There's a way for them to feel like I can, I can point to that be like, oh, maybe this activity was harder for you, but I just saw you kill like that story. You told this gorgeous story, like how fantastic was that? So I try and have a nice variety of activities so everybody can come away and it doesn't happen every time, obviously. Um, but people can have something that they're coming away feeling proud of or feeling like, oh, that went well or whatever. So that's it for me. Thanks for listening all. Thank you, Elisa. <laughs> Thanks so much for sharing. Appreciate you being up for sharing, even though, as you said, you're getting used to your position, but you have plenty to share. So thank you. And next up, we will hear from Kaylin Bergstrom with a uh, program coordinator with Age Pride Center. So Kaylin, welcome. Go ahead and share. Great, thanks. Um, yep, so I'm Kaylin with uh, Age Pride and we run a support and social group. So kind of a mixture for LGBTQ older adults with early stages of memory loss who live alone. Um, so a lot of shared experience in this very particular group. So what has helped us with building rapport and connection in this online format? I think for us, one thing was keeping the group relatively small. So we have six to eight members um, maximum. And that really gives everybody a chance to feel like they have the space to talk and share and participate. Um, and, and everyone gets time within the hour that we meet. Um, and then we also keep it as a closed group each quarter. So, so we operate it quarterly and at the end, new folks can join and existing members can move on if they like. Um, but this really helps during that series of weeks to really develop deeper relationship and getting to know each other on a deeper level. Um, and so having, having it as a, as a closed group for periods of time has been helpful. Um, and then another thing that we do is we really co-create the space with the participants. Um, so I include them in the planning and really getting their feedback and input about what they want to get out of the group. You know, are there particular topics they want to make sure we discuss um, or anything that we want to do? And and just really making sure that it's it's a collaborative 
experience so that everybody has some ownership over the the space that we create together. Um, and so so that's been really nice. And so an example is, you know, during the pandemic, a lot of folks have been experiencing a lot of anxiety and wanted space to talk about how that is impacting their experience of their memory loss. Um, so we've made sure that we have space to talk about that, but then also making space for fun and laughter. Um, like Elisa said, uh, it's, it's, it's really valuable to have, have both of those kind of, uh, polarity as I guess you could say. Um, and then another thing we do is we start our sessions with a mindfulness activity and that just really pulls the energy together and gets everybody present and grounded. Um, and we keep it brief, just like two minutes max, um, just like a simple breathing exercise, or maybe we do like a body scan, but something just to bring everybody to the present. Um, and then we do we do check-ins each week. So every every single person has time to share and they can share, you know, whatever comes to mind for them. Um, but a, a fun thing that we do is we have people call and nominate one of their peers to go next. And so that opportunity of getting to like, you know, hear your name said out loud and called on by one of your peers in the group um, has helped folks just like really feel connected to each other. And um, I think another thing as far as, you know, being online, I, I have a plan, but I'm very flexible. So oftentimes I'll have, okay, this is maybe the, our discussion for today, but whatever theme emerges from the check-in, sometimes, you know, there's some more pressing um, issues or, or topics that people really wanna talk about. So just keeping really flexible to flow with where the energy is with the group um, has has worked well. And then also just creating space for folks to share about their lives, you know, sharing, um, you know, information about their childhood or, or you know, their pets. Um, we do kind of like a little pet show and tell sometimes. Um, so just things to like share about their, their lives um, to help get to know one another. Um, and then what has helped to create an inclusive environment online when there's different technology experience or familiarity, um, speaking up, et cetera. So one of the things is, is anytime someone's gonna join their group, I talk with them just about what their experience and comfort level is with using Zoom. Zoom's the format that we use. And I offer if, if they want any assistance to kind of do a one-on-one -on -one tutorial um, to kind of help bridge any gaps there might be. Um, and then also I'm available to troubleshoot with folks afterwards if issues came up during the session. Um, and that's worked well so far. Um, I also think it's ideal to have two facilitators if you can, because um, then one person can continue leading the group while another one is helping someone um, if they're having some tech challenges. Um, and then, I just stay really attentive to who's engaging, how are they engaging, are people um, not speaking as much, and I try to loop them into the conversation. Um, again, not putting them on the spot, but just creating an opening so that everybody can share. Um, Cause you know, sometimes we've got folks at, at different, have different experiences with their memory. And so some might have a harder time um, feeling like they can interject into a conversation, especially if there's lots of back and forth. So just being attentive and making space for folks to uh, be able to talk if they've been a little bit more quiet um, in the group. And then um, just being being able to tie everything together with a theme in the, in the discussion and like really validating every contribution that people make, um, even if it's a, you know, on a different topic, just finding a way to kind of bring it all together. So that's, yeah, that's what I have to share. Oh, and one more thing I will say, just embracing silence, I think has been a really beautiful thing, just like allowing silence to happen and it's been great. Thank you so much, Kaylin. I really appreciate you. You sound like such a marvelous facilitator. Um, appreciate all the tips that you share with us. 
Last but not least, we get to hear from Lindsay Waldner, who is the program coordinator with Elderwise. Welcome, Lindsay. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I am the program coordinator. Um, I just started this role recently, but I've also been facilitating programs for Elderwise for a while. So um, we right now we have two online programs. We have MiniWise, which is like a guided conversation group, um, and ArtWise, which is an arts-based group where we um, create art and then share it together during the hour. Um, so similarly um, to Kaylin, we wanted to keep our groups, our group sizes small um, from the beginning. We wanted to make sure that everybody had that kind of opportunity to share and that they felt um, comfortable and weren't self-conscious kind of being in a larger group. Um, and just to have, if you're looking at, you know, on a Zoom gallery view, the, the boxes are large enough that people can see each other's faces um, clearly. Um, another way that we kind of try to build in that rapport and that community is just by structuring with kind of ritual and routine. So um, if you start a conversation group, like with some deep breaths um, to kind of draw everybody in and um, settle everybody. Um, our ArtWise group, we kind of have the same structure every week. So we start off by discussing our theme for the week and we give everybody an opportunity to share what their inspiration is for their artwork. Um, and then we have a, a quiet time where we all paint together. Um, and then at the end we share our paintings and we take um, like a screenshot of everyone holding up their paintings. And then we'll email that out to the group afterward just as a way for everybody to be able to look at it again and enjoy the paintings. Um, we have one participant who her care partner occasionally will print out those gallery shots and hang them up on the wall. Um, for her to look at during the week with her painting so that she can kind of continue to enjoy that. Um, and our programs are geared toward people with memory loss. Most of our participants tend to be kind of in the middle to later stages um, and of memory loss. So we do encourage people to join um, with a care partner or a friend or someone who can help them with the technology. Um, a lot of them are not able to join on their own. Um, and so we do encourage the, the care partners to participate in the conversation as well, but we try to make sure the focus is on the people with memory loss. And so um, one way we do that is just kind of in the way we ask questions um, in our discussion groups. We make sure we get people's attention, we'll say their name, um, kind of draw them into the conversation. Um, care partners can help with that as well if it doesn't seem like um, they're quite connecting just to give them that cue that we're asking a question. And then we really take our time asking the question. So kind of restating the topic, um, maybe summarizing what a few other participants have said so that if someone has a harder time following the conversation, we can make sure that they're brought back in um, and they have that context um, for what we're talking about before we ask them a question. Um, and then just giving them that time to prepare. And again, we kind of have a structure for our conversation group where each participant knows that they'll be called on kind of two or three times. So it's sort of go around a circle with one question and then have another question that relates to the topic. Um, so this kind of helps if some people want to talk a lot more and they know that they're going to be, they're gonna have another chance. So. Um, it's easier to kind of listen um, to others. And then for people that are a little, um, have a little bit harder time verbalizing and they might not be able to just break into a conversation, um, it gives them that space as well to be included. Um, and we also kind of really focus on valuing every type of contribution. Um, so we have people who are, can verbalize a lot more and people that, you know, we might understand a few words out of they're sharing. Um, so we really take that time to magnify everybody's answers. So we can pick out a couple of words, um, just kind of bringing it around, putting it in the context or trying to summarize what they were saying or just kind of paying attention to the energy um, and the emotion that people are sharing and commenting on that, um, thanking them for that, that sharing. Um, we had one participant for a while who, um, really when you'd ask him a question, he couldn't verbalize, but he would be very emotive with his hands. Um, so sometimes we would just take time, we would spend that time with him, just all putting our hands up in the screen and feeling that emotion and feeling that, um, connecting with him 
in that way. So just finding different ways to connect with people. Um, and yeah, we also love silence um, in our groups and just making sure that we're giving that, that space um, for everyone. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lindsay. Appreciate you so much and recognize and acknowledge Elderwise as the pioneers in this kind of work going decades back to plant, plant so many seeds here in Washington around dementia-friendly programming and inclusion. So thank you for sharing with us. We have a bit of time for questions. So if people would like to ask any question or respond to anything that Elisa or Kaylin or Lindsay shared, you're welcome to raise your hand on screen and I can call on you. You can also type a question into chat. So Marilyn, let's start with you. You wanna unmute yourself. Yes, um, I wanted to ask Lindsay a question um, regarding art, the medium that you use or how does that work in group? Um, or are they, if you're doing it virtually, I would assume then each is using something different at home. Is that it? How does that work? Yeah, so we, um, we mostly do watercolor painting. So people are welcome to use if they have supplies at home or we've been providing people, we put together some art kits with paper and paints um, and just different supplies that they might need for the projects. And then we can send them to people. Um, ahead of the class if they don't have their own supplies. Um, so we mostly do watercolor. We usually start, we, we've been doing it kind of in six week um, sections. So people can sign up for a six week series. And we start out with like a kind of a simple mandala coloring sheet that everybody can have and print out um, just to kind of get warmed up with art. Um, and then we do a different theme every week and people paint. And then usually our last week we'll do kind of a collage. So if people wanna bring different things, pictures or, um, so we have a few different things, but it's mostly watercolor painting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Carol, I see your hand there. You wanna unmute yourself? This question is also for Lindsay. Hi, um, I, I heard you say that you had the care partners there but that they were taking a minor role. So my question is, did you have some orientation for them before they joined so they'd know when and how to participate? We haven't really done that. I think we kind of um, have relied a lot on just kind of modeling for people. Um, so, I mean, we'll have people that come for a while and um, it's definitely different dynamics for everyone, though it takes a little while. We have some people that want to just answer for um, mm -hmm. their partner. Um, and so we'll kind of, you know, let them do that, but then also say, well, I'd love to, you know, love to hear what so whoever this person yeah, has right. to say and just kind of um, trying to make sure that we're, we're modeling that it's okay if people have a hard time um, getting words out or whatever it is that they, um, struggle with. So modeling that acceptance um, seems to be working so so far. <laughs> I like that transition uh, from the person that said too much for their care first partner. Say thank you that for that and I'd like to hear what your partner has to also say. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you're validating both folk and I like that. Right. Yeah, everyone's included. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions or comments? Well, I have another one since I've not muted myself back. <laughs> I've noticed that most of the people who have talked so far are working with the people with dementia and not with support groups. Is that correct? Um, so yeah, the focus of this Dementia Friendly Washington Learning Collaborative is on dementia friendly programs, so programs for people with dementia and with the focus on more like um, community engagement and social engagement, creative engagement type of focus. I love that. The, the group I was with in Arizona, my, partic my participation was with the dementia people, the people with dementia. And it was fun and we laughed a lot and we shared a lot and talking about their backgrounds and their favorite pets, that was wonderful. So 
Lindsay, I like it. I like what you guys are doing. This is my first time here, so thank you. You're so welcome. It's good to have you here, Carol. And Pam, I saw your hand go up because we'll still have something to say. I do. Um, and this may be a totally different question. Uh, we are at the point where some of our individuals move now into memory care facilities. And I'm just wondering, um, are any of you, and specifically our speakers, but, but anyone could answer, finding any success in our understaffed um, memory care facilities, having aides being able to help get, people's, get people on Zoom? one of the individuals that um, is one of our best players and absolutely loves class uh, wasn't able to attend yesterday because all of a sudden he's uh, in a memory care facility and his partner is not there yet so i just i just wondered if i mean obviously that's a huge need are are any of you having seeing success in that area where communities are actively helping or are we just in such an understaffed situation um, that that just is not doing very well at the moment? Well, look, first, uh, or, yeah, folks who shared, Elisa. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have, um, I think, one person who comes regularly who's in memory care and I'm in touch with the activities director for that, mm -hmm. it's with Aegis. Mm -hmm. um, and so they make sure an aid, and she's our most regular participant to be honest, which is awesome. Um, the stuff there's been so helpful, but they go in and they set it up and turn it on and they bring, I think it's an iPad, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, set it up for her, unmute her and then Usually if she has issues, then she just goes outside the door and usually somebody has been walking by and will come in and help her. But we've been trying to get them to have more members um, come to our program. And that's been hard because then you know, they can only do so many programs like that at a time. So I think your point of it being understaffed is real and the HS is really well resourced, so. I, I'm glad to hear that uh, at, at least it's, it's happening sometimes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, they've been great, but I think it's hard at a larger scale. Yeah. But I would build those relationships with activity directors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Marilyn? Yes, uh, thank you for the question. Um, I It just came to me because I'm often asked about different residences or homes or um, what's available for a change in a home setting uh, for someone is it's a good question to ask how are they supported um, thank you for that question Pam because that's a huge item for someone are they supported with something that is virtual as far as a, a program or group or um, you know it hadn't come to me before that that should be one more question to ask when you're trying to decide on the appropriate or right uh, residential experience for your loved one. Thank you. Where will they be supported? What would be important for this individual? And do they have that, you know, so. For just a few more minutes, I see Karen or Thompson raised hand. So this question is for Kaylin because she commented that um, a lot of your participants live alone. Um, and so how are you overcoming that technological barrier or is there one? Yeah, no, that's, that's a great question. Um, well, first of all, one, one of the things and part of how we found this group is folks in the LGBTQ community um, that um, have memory loss or not are more likely to not have like a, a care partner or someone helping them. Um, and so we're living alone. 
And our, our group right now is folks that are like very, very early. And so they're still able to safely live independently. Um, and we haven't had any um, issues to the point where someone would need someone else to come and set up technology for them. Me being able to talk them through the process over the phone um, has has been sufficient, but um, you know, having having either volunteers or staffing capacity to be able to have those one on one kind of tutorials and troubleshooting um, is is important because they don't have someone else to kind of help walk them through. You know, like if they're having internet troubles or something like that. So, um, so I've been fortunate that I've been able to provide that one-on-one -on -one myself. Um, but yeah, if you have volunteers that can help troubleshoot tech issues with your participants, that can also be a great um, kind of work around with the folks that, that are living alone. Great. Thank you. We have time for one more question, if there is one more. Yes, Sandy. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I had a comment um, to Pam's uh, question about, you know, being in a community. We have um, someone at North Haven who the, and I, it's, it's typically activities. I think I agree that's a good contact person, but also the, this is a small community. So sometimes the front desk or whoever is available will, will help. But I feel, I think it's really important when people move into communities to try to maintain some thread of their previous life. So I agree that how important that is, Pam, you know, for um, people to be able to continue to do what was meaningful to them before, now that they're in a community. So that was, and eight, we had an experience with ages too that we've had, and one was at an adult family home. And that was when their, their care partner was very a, a strong advocate you know, for them and participated as well too, so. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you, Sandy. All right, let's give another round of applause to our wonderful folks who shared. Thank you to Elisa, thank you to Kaylin, thank you to Lindsay, really appreciate you. And if you others in the group have not had a chance to share yet, next time could be your chance. So feel free to reach out if you're feeling like, oh my gosh, I really wanna share uh, the kind of work that I'm doing and tips we're gonna be focusing on dimension friendly programming in December when we meet. So anyways, if anybody's feeling eager, I'm planting the seed now. <laughs>